Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, what I'm going to speak about uh, draws in part on DFID's experience, but also gives some, uh, some more personal reflections on the issue. Within DFID, as Tony mentioned, we do have earmarked climate funds, uh, which by, the, uh, by next year will amount to about 8% of our, the UK's ODA spend. So having earmarked climate funds is good, but the risk is that you tend to focus on the earmarked funds and you forget about the other 92% of ODA. So part of what I want to talk about are some of the challenges in not just spending the 8%, the but trying to get the other 92% uh, more climate smart, as it were. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, outline five challenges as I see them and then come up with some solutions and look at the implications for research. Very briefly, the five challenges concern a perceived short-term, long-term trade-off, uh, the issue of uncertainty, which has already been addressed, uh, breaking uh, climate change out of the environment box, how to leave a private action, and uh, actually mainstreaming within climate change. Uh, so, okay, briefly, what do I mean by these five challenges? There's certainly a perception that action on climate change, uh, climate change is many, many ways still seen as a long-term issue. Uh, as Mika said, clearly there are more climate impacts starting to materialise. Uh, but in many ways, and certainly on the mitigation side, climate change is seen as a long-term issue. Therefore, it's often perceived as being a trade-off between what we do on climate change and what we do on our more immediate objective of cutting poverty now. Uh, this isn't some sort of unthinking climate deniers uh, approach. It's actually often very, very practical. Take Bangladesh. Do you build five primary schools to a very, very basic standard, which may very well be washed away in the next season, or do you build one or two schools to a far higher standard? So it's, it's actually, you know, many of the issues we're trying to grapple with are really quite practical. Uh, deep uncertainty has already been touched upon. Uh, so as Miko said, it's not that we lack uncertainty in other aspects of development, but I think because climate change has been quite explicit in acknowledging what the degree of uncertainty is in what it is we're trying to achieve, in many ways, climate change is, is now being seen as being harder than other aspects of development. One thing, and this is maybe a bit more of a personal reflection on the uncertainty, is I also perceive that there's a bit of a mismatch between the scientific consensus and what the economics often tells us. So the scientists are uh, increasingly telling us, and every time a new IPCC report comes out, it comes out you know, more forcefully, that we've gone beyond two degrees. You know, we're into potentially four degree territory, which is unknown, it's uncharted territory. You know, we're seeing this year changes in the Arctic sea ice and melting, and we just don't know what that's gonna do, even for the Northern Hemisphere. We're seeing far more impacts in, in lower income countries as well. But if you then look at what the economics tells us, looking at integrated assessment models, they say, well, actually, we're still gonna grow. It's just we won't grow quite as fast as we would otherwise have grown. So there's almost a, a mismatch between the scientists who are painting a picture of Armageddon's may be overstated, but really quite frightening uncharted territory. In the economics, which the big picture economics tends to put us back into our safety zone, our comfort zone. So yeah, things won't be as good as they would otherwise have been, but the economics isn't telling us that we're facing imminent collapse of all our systems. So there is, a, there is an issue, I think, in terms of how to mainstream, uh, that the economics and the science maybe aren't as tied together as they might be. We need to break climate change out of the environmental box. Uh, within DFID, climate change sits within a department that still has environment in its name. Uh, in many of the countries with which we work, climate change is still seen as being the lead of what are often quite weak environment ministries. So we need to try to get, get the message across that climate change isn't an environment issue, it's a core development issue. The, my fourth point concerned uh, the private sector. Governments clearly have a key role to play in uh, addressing climate change, both in terms of trying to put in place the systems to provide the information to get a more effective adaptation, and also to drive the incentives for uh, mitigation. But most of what needs to be done will actually need to be done by private companies and will need to be done by individuals and households. So there's a challenge of how do we motivate that action? How do we, what's the best role of uh, government spend and donor spend in doing that? And my final point, my final challenge, uh, is that climate change itself often isn't mainstreamed within climate change. That might seem a rather strange thing to say, but 
a lot of what we do on, say, the mitigation side, the models we use, the economic models, a lot of them are based around marginal abatement cost curves. Many of those marginal abatement cost curves, in effect, don't assume any climate change. So you're looking at the, the relative costs of different technologies. But, you know, if you're comparing coal with uh, renewables, do your marginal abatement cost curves actually factor in what climate change might do for the availability of water for cooling? Do they factor in the increased uh, unreliability, therefore, of certain uh, high-carbon technologies? So there's an issue even within climate change of whether climate change has mainstream climate change within climate change. Okay, so what might some of the solutions be to this? On the issue of the long-term, short-term trade-off, there's clearly a key role for more research. I mean, this is a point that both Mikko and uh, Henning have mentioned. Uh, so we need to better understand the extent to which a trade-off does or doesn't exist at particular points in time. So we can do this using, uh, in terms of project appraisal, you know, we're exploring the use of real option analysis to say, well, at what point should you build more resilient primary schools or should you build more schools that will, uh, might very well be destroyed in a relatively short space of time. So the economics can inform this. But I think my perception of adaptation is it's grown out of a livelihoods uh, discipline. So adaptation is often seen as a very bottom-up uh, discipline. I think economics can bring a, a more top-down perspective which will complement the bottom-up. So I think the role of economics and the role of many of you in the room here is to ask, what patterns of economic development will actually help build an economy's resilience to the impacts of climate change? And the answers to that don't necessarily lie in climate change economics. They lie in actually what we do as development economists on a, uh, you know, maybe not a day-to-day -day basis, but in certainly the sort of issues we've been grappling with for several years. So we know that, for example, that uh, more diversified economies are likely to be more resilient. But how do we get more diversified economies? You know, what is the role of industrial policy? What is the, uh, how, exactly do we, how exactly do we encourage diversification? We know flexibility is important, but flexibility where in the economy? What, 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 are the, what are the parts of the economy where flexibility is most important? The, the challenge of mitigation has also been touched upon. DFID tends to work uh, and is increasingly focusing its uh, portfolio on uh, poorer and poorer countries. So again, many, these countries don't have uh, any obligation, uh, legal obligation to spend their own money on mitigation, and therefore there is perceived as a very strong trade-off uh, between uh, promoting lower carbon and often more expensive technologies and uh, conventional economic growth. But there may be, as, uh, as both Henning and Miko mentioned, there may be uh, synergies uh, there may be uh, co-benefits of going low carbon, and it would be good to know to what extent going low carbon is actually in an economy's own interests. On uncertainty, approaches are emerging on how to deal with this. The catch here is that many of these approaches and many of the modelling approaches which uh, your own work has been uh, uh, doing over the last uh, year or so, they're actually quite complicated. And I think the challenge in terms of mainstreaming is not the challenge for me is trying to uh, present to the policymakers that I need to convince that really, really complicated economic modelling is made even more complicated and trying to simplify that. So the, we have difficulty often explaining to ministers uh, what the output from com, uh, com, uh, CGE modelling is. So if what your work is doing is painting the black box of CGE modelling yet blacker still, we're going to have more difficulty encouraging our ministers that the results from that modelling is credible and should be taken on board. So I'm not saying don't do complicated work. Uh, where you have complexity, you will need uh, new approaches. But where you have the choice between simple solutions and complicated solutions, simple may be better. Breaking climate change out of the environment box, uh, I mean, in many ways, that's what these sort of events are about. It's about uh, bringing economics and climate change economics to address the sort of challenges that ministries of finance, ministries of planning are concerned with. So that, that shouldn't be an insurmountable problem. But it does mean that we need to ask the right questions. We need to be, the research needs to be addressed. It's sort of, sort of practical questions that uh, ministries of finance are uh, engaged with. In terms of uh, encouraging private action, we know a certain amount about this, but we also know not only, as Nick Stern has put it, that climate change is a consequence of one of the world's biggest market failures, 
But we also know that many of the solutions to tackling climate change are themselves impeded by a range of market failures. Energy efficiency, if you take your marginal abatement cost curve, it would appear that there are huge energy efficiencies available. Uh, the catch is that these, many of these do not, are not materialising owing to a range of market failures. So I think there's, in terms of encouraging private action, we need better to understand what the sort of market failures are to understand which ones are the most binding in order that we can help prioritise policy, uh, it, gradually removing these barriers. My final point was about mainstreaming climate change within climate change. Again, this isn't rocket science. Both Hennig and Mika have mentioned the importance of ensuring that we don't just do mitigation or adaptation. We need to find ways of doing uh, climate resilient, low carbon development. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think it's an indispensable problem. And many of the papers that uh, I think will be discussed over the next couple of days are trying to bring this agenda together. One, one final point is that in terms of what we need from the research community is we need evidence. Evidence is hard in this area because we're actually looking at things that haven't yet happened. I do feel a lot of what we, we are actually presented with, a lot of the so-called evidence is in fact advocacy. What we need is evidence. We don't need advocacy at this stage. Uh, so please even where your results are maybe not the result you would want if you're committed to climate change, give the result anyway. We, we need to inform and foster a debate. Thank you.